You're listening to the Heart of Giving podcast with Art Taylor, powered by BBBGive.org. Here we explore the motivations that form the basis of giving and service. We inspire generosity and celebrate the transformative effects that giving and service have on the human spirit and on community. The conversations featured on the podcast also uncover giving strategies that educate and provide tools to help listeners make impactful gifts of both their time and money. We hope you enjoy this episode. Welcome to the Heart of Giving podcast, powered by BBBGive.org. Give.org is the nation's standards-based charity evaluator and your one-stop source for information on giving, and reports on the most asked about charities. I'm Art Taylor, your host. And with me today is my friend, Hillary Pennington, who I met many years ago when she was heading an organization called Jobs for the Future. We're going to talk a little bit about Jobs for the Future. And now she is the executive vice president of program at the Ford Foundation, which is taking on amazing work to help our society become more just and equitable. Hillary also spent some time at the Gates Foundation prior to her stint now at Ford, and she is one of the most respected philanthropic leaders in our nation. Hillary serves on the boards of Bard College, the Center for Effective Philanthropy, Giving Tuesday, and she's a member of the Trinity Church Vestry. She's a graduate of the Yale School of Management and Yale College, And she also has a degree in social anthropology from Oxford University and a master's degree in theological studies from the Episcopal Divinity School. Hillary, it's great to have you on the Heart of Giving podcast. All right. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you for having me. Hillary, I think it was sometime back in the 1990s, mid 1990s, maybe when we met, you were leading an organization you founded at the time called Jobs for the Future. And our good friend, Jane Poland, introduced us to form a collaboration. I was working at OIC, Opportunities Industrialization Centers at the time. And we were working together to help youth at the Benjamin Franklin High School, which is when we first met. And it's just been delightful to check in with you over the years. And I just have this one question, I I guess, first, uh, could you have imagined back in your jobs for the future days that you would be vice president of programs at the Ford Foundation? Not in a hundred years, Art, would I have imagined that I would be sitting where I am. And you probably would not have imagined the same thing either. You know, I think that's the great thing about doing the kind of of work we do, where you feel called to work on a set of issues and you follow where it takes you. That's very true. How is Jobs for the Future doing these days? Jobs for the Future is doing astonishingly well. It is now over 35 years old. You know, they keep an employee record. Each time that someone joins, they get a number and it has employed well over 3,000 people in its life. Wow. So, you know, people who kind of grew up thinking about the values and the the ideas that motivated Arthur and White and me to start it. And it is a big organization. Over 120 people work there. It's doing just astonishing work on the issues of workforce development and youth development and early college, high school. I could not be more proud of what they're doing. Led now by its third woman, Maria Flynn, and still based in Boston. So what was it that led you to create the organization or to be one of the co-founders? Oh, that's an interesting question. So the idea for it existed before I came on the scene. A wonderful, wonderful man named Arthur White, who helped to found an organization called Yankelovich Skelly and White, one of the early public opinion research firms in the country, had the idea for it. And he was in his 60s at the time, still running the company. But they, one of their big clients, actually this overlaps with you and OIC, one of their big clients at the time was, I believe, General Motors. And I believe the founder of OIC was on the board of General Motors at that time, Leon Sullivan. That's correct. He was. 
And they were looking at the public opinion data about the company. And the company was basically saying a lot of the jobs that we have lost, this being in the 1980s, are never coming back. And we don't know what our responsibility is. We don't know what to do. And Arthur got the idea of creating something called Jobs for the Future that would would try to skate ahead of the puck and anticipate the ways in which work was changing and what the education and training system needed to do ahead of time to change along with it so that people would be able to seize the opportunities of the future. So he put together a tiny team to start work in one state, which was the state of Connecticut, where he lived. And I, at the time, was just finishing a master's degree at the Yale School of Management and didn't know what I wanted to do or where I wanted to work. And he came and gave a speech. And I thought, you know, that's the thing that I want to do. And we weren't able to connect. I ended up taking a job at a company. But Arthur and I did finally connect. The company I worked for was was Aetna. It gave me a leave of absence for a year to go and work with Arthur to stand up what was then Jobs for Connecticut's Future. And I, you know, I never looked back. I never went back. We expanded from that one state to a second state, which was Arkansas. And Bill Clinton was the governor. We did a lot of deep work there and really grew out from there. That's amazing. You know, it just shows you how things connect. You mentioned Leon Sullivan, the first African-American to serve on a major corporate board at General Motors, was the founder of OIC, you know, which is an organization aimed at economic and social justice. Of course, Reverend Sullivan led an amazing, amazingly impactful life. But a lot of Reverend Sullivan's work was funded by the Ford Foundation. Yes. Leon helped put together the principles about divestment in South Africa. And the Ford Foundation really played a major role in the transition from the apartheid era to the free South Africa. So isn't it funny, all the various points of intersection. And your connection to South Africa. And mine. I was born in South Africa and was very involved in the anti-apartheid movement on college campuses as I was coming up. So yes. Well, that was also a, a time where you got to witness, I would say, injustice up close. And it had to have some impact on the woman you became and, and the work that you take on today, even at Ford, I would, I would suspect. Oh, it had a huge impact on me. You know, but I'm ashamed to say, as I grew up, I, I spent time going back and forth between South Africa, where I was born, my father was South African, and St. Louis, my mother's city. And I, in those days, I thought the United States was better than South Africa. I did not even begin to understand the the depth and the scope and the, and the durability of institutionalized racism in this country. And I was an insufferable snob <laughs> to my cousins mm. and my family in those years. So I, I, it, both of those experiences were deeply formative for me in, in just coming to understand injustice, especially as a person who's, who is white. But yes, South Africa has has played a huge role in my life. Yeah, I'm sure it has. And I am just really happy to see the work that you're doing now at Ford in a variety of areas. First, of course, the great work that Ford is taking on to create justice in our society, to help create justice, to help the leaders and organizations who are working in the trenches to create a more just and equitable society. And I'm also really fascinated about your writings these days about how we can bridge the gulfs, I guess, ideological gulfs that exist in our country. And I hope we can get a chance to talk about both of those things. But I noticed that you wrote a piece for the, I guess it's a monograph that appeared for the Leap Ambassadors, which is an organization founded by the Marino Institute. And you make some really important comments in that monograph that go to how a foundation or a grant-making organization or entity should interact with their grantees. And I wish you would talk a little bit about what you've learned at Ford and having been a grant seeker 
at one point in your life to now being at the pinnacle of grant making. What have you learned in some of those things you you mentioned in in this wonderful document that I commend to all our listeners, the Funding Performance Monograph? Well, thank you for that plug. It's a great monograph with a lot of really important essays in it, Art. You know, what's that saying? Everything I learned in li- about life, I learned in kindergarten. Everything I've learned about philanthropy, I learned as a grant seeker, mm. um, as have you. Yeah. And I think the, you know, the 20 plus years I spent leading an organization just gave me a deep and passionate conviction that the ways in which foundations fund organizations are not as impactful as they could be. In fact, they're the opposite. The way most foundation funding goes out into the world makes organizations weaker rather than stronger. You know, the majority of foundation funding, well over 80%, goes out as project grants, not general support grants. And it goes out in one-year or two-year grants, not multi-year grants. So from the organization's point of view, it's almost impossible to have the security to let that organization plan and really build excellence. One of the things that Ford has done to act on that set of values, which Darren, who also started out life as a grant seeker, also deeply shares, is this program we have put in place called the BUILD program. And When Darren's presidency started, we put in place a $1 billion commitment over a six-year period to fund key grantee partner organizations, giving them five-year general support grants with an institution strengthening component to help them work on various aspects of their resilience and stability that would help them be stronger. And we just renewed that, and we made that announcement last week. And in announcing it, I I wrote, with the help of a colleague at Ford, my all-time favorite image, which is this image of an ambulance rushing to the scene of an accident and having to stop at the corner because its tank of gas wasn't full enough to get it there, to call its funder, to ask if it could please, please fill up. And the funder saying, yes, you can have a quarter tank, you know, which would get you to the next corner. When what you really want is for the organizations that are working to fight the hardest fights of our time to have a full tank of gas and to have the confidence that they know the route to get to the end goal better and faster than than we do. And that working in that way from a foundation's point of view does not mean that you sacrifice impact or accountability for results. It's just a better way to get to better results. Yeah, you mentioned in that article, Hillary, that you think we can be our own worst enemy in philanthropy. Do you want to elaborate on that? Well, yes. I, You know, I think we hold a set of, of really false dichotomies. I mean, one is we want to be accountable for using the money that we have and using it well. And so we think that having very discrete strategies is a way to do that, when in fact, Almost every important issue that any foundation works on will take years, if not decades, to make to make serious progress. So we we have a myth that short term grants can advance long term change, and that is that is something that we really need to question. So that's that's one. You know, the second is that highly specified outcomes. You know, down to the level of you need to report back to us on this particular way that you spent each dollar in this grant is a way to advance accountability. And I think we've learned from our experience with our build grant making that that just does not need to be the case. You know, we still negotiate with our grantees the kinds of outcomes that they are trying to accomplish. And we have our own set of outcomes we are trying to accomplish. But together, we're able to figure out much more responsible metrics for judging progress towards outcomes than I think the very narrow um, and too often rigid ways that foundations work allow. And then, you know, I think another reason sometimes that foundations are shy away from doing this kind of funding is that they pressure their program officers, you know, to also take short time horizons. And we have found working with our grant makers at Ford that that entering into these relationships that are really about the the whole work that an organization is trying to accomplish changes the nature of the relationship between the program officer and the grantee. And instead of the conversations being about a narrow project, they become to be about, you know, what keeps that the executive director up at night? How can they be having greater impact? What can we do to help them? And I think that all of that, if you think 
about our work being essentially transformational work through others. That's basically what foundations do. It's a much better way to try to have that impact. One of the things you also mentioned is the importance of creating a diverse organization from which to make those grants. And of course, Ford is one of the more diverse organizations that we have in the funding field right now. In fact, I wrote about about this uh, some months ago in how many foundations seem to lack diversity, particularly at the governance level, at the board level. And I was able to happily point out that Ford was one of the organizations that seemed to be getting it right. But inside the organization, I suspect that after Darren arrived, there may have been some room for change in that regard. How did you go about that? And what were some of the challenges associated with it? Well, it's such a great question, Art. I mean, Darren and I talk a lot about this, actually. Our board is very diverse. It's half women, half people of color, incredibly accomplished leaders. And Darren's point of view was you start at the top. You start with your governance structure. So he did that. But the leadership team that he put in place early in his presidency was mostly white. And with the exception of me and our director of of human resources was all men. And we got so much wrong because we were not able to understand the ways in which the decisions that we were taking would land on the broader organization. And slowly over time, the composition of that leadership team has changed through a combination of deliberate hiring and also really deliberate promotion from within. And so today it is more than half women. It is more than half women of color, people of color. And we are so much more effective, a leadership team, without even needing to think about it, just because we bring a diversity of perspective that helps us make better decisions. Yeah. Well, that, you know, that's that's really so important. And I hope that message gets out to others in the philanthropic space, because it's not simply about just creating diversity for diversity's sake, which is not a bad thing, but it's also about performance. It's about helping you meet your mission and, and getting to a point where your organization can make grants that are going to be impactful. So in terms of that, how did the Ford Foundation come to its decision and you know, to create a strategy around justice and equality? Well, that's a great question. And, you know, we are an 80-year-old foundation. So always through our history, we have worked on issues of justice. But I would say that in previous iterations of Ford, the Ford you and I knew when we were young, yep. super snappers starting out in our careers, Ford kind of blended two archetypes of a foundation. One was really a development foundation, almost, you might say, that worked on things like education and assets and workforce development and jobs and livelihoods. And then an additional foundation that worked on human rights and justice kinds of issues and issues of discrimination and culture. And when Darren became president, and those two things existed together in a very synergistic way that was actually important in many parts of the world where Ford had offices, because some of our grantees would be holding governments to account for failures in human rights, while others of our grantees would be helping solve very concrete problems to make people's lives better, you know, problems where we had a common interest, perhaps with a government. But a lot changed in the field of philanthropy and also in the world. And as Darren and all of us who are leaders at the foundation now came into our jobs in 2013, you know, we, we were challenged by the board that, the, that we, were, we were spread too thin. And they really wanted us to think about a way in which we could tighten and deepen the focus of the foundation. And as we went through a process to think about what would that mean, we began to realize and to see the enormous acceleration in inequality that was happening, not only in the United States, but everywhere around the world, and how destabilizing inequality of that dimension is for any society, destabilizing politically, economically, culturally. And as we thought about those kinds of issues, we asked ourselves, you know, what, what are the things that drive inequality to keep repeating itself? And they were less things like 
your and my early passion workforce development, and they were more things like fairness of political representation and issues of, of power and, in, and inclusion. They were things like deep and systemic racism or discrimination on the basis of gender or disability or sexuality. They were things like unjust economic systems where the rules of the game were rigged. So that was the first important thing was it was a diagnosis that said, we need to think more deeply about what we work on if we want to try to make a meaningful impact on inequality. And then the second thing that that helped us make the decision that we did was all the other players that have come into philanthropy and continue to come into philanthropy, particularly new entrants like the Gates Foundation and many others. And, and by and large, many of those new philanthropies gravitate to, to issues like workforce development or education, you know, things where, where there, the impetus is to think about what's a particular kind of intervention or innovation that can get funded that would fix a problem, agriculture, health. But you can work on those problems without changing the underlying power dynamics that cause those needs to keep perpetuating themselves. So we felt there was both a need for us to work on these deeper kinds of drivers of inequality, and there was the space to do that because there were other funders who could pick up some of the kinds of things Ford used to do. And we were better able to take the risk of working on these kinds of deep and perhaps more controversial issues. So that has changed, you know, that caused a number of very painful exits from fields that we had been supporting for a long period of time. But it has also created a unifying focus for our work here in the United States and across the world that has been incredibly important. I would agree. And it is good that we have a philanthropy out there focused on, I would say, some of the more fundamental challenges that sort of drive everything else. You know, it's hard to get economics right if we're going to be a society that doesn't value a person because of their background or their color. So those are things that we do have to try to drive to, to improve. And Hillary, you know, if I were to say to you, point to some of the early successes that you believe you're having in that regard, recognizing, of course, that this is a long struggle that we're going to be in. It's a long struggle that we've been in. What would you point us to at this point? Well, it is a long struggle. And the first thing I would say is one of the reasons we believe so strongly in the BUILD program and in building strong and durable organizations is that when you are working on issues of social justice, for every time you have a win, there's a backlash against that win. We funded lawsuits against voting rights violations in Mississippi in the 1960s. And we're funding the same thing again, the same on you know reproductive rights. So in some ways, there is progress, but the work is never done and you need to be constantly vigilant. And so having organizations that are prepared and knowledgeable about how to do that, that kind of ongoing battle is really, really important. I would say though, that we there are really, really important wins. You know, some of them we are seeing in work we do internationally, we do a lot of work on climate justice, mainly centering the need and the importance of land rights for indigenous peoples. And in a place like Indonesia, for example, there are now a set of policies, again, you know, slow progress over time, but a change in laws and policies and ways in which the country negotiates as it makes contracts with developers and people who are working in the extractive industry there. Still a lot of work to do. But we are also able to network activists across places. So, we, you know, indigenous peoples in the Amazon that are working on similar kinds of issues. And one of the things a foundation as big as ours can do is to invest in connecting activists and the kinds of common good infrastructure they need that they couldn't invest in themselves, like strategic communications. I, I think those are really very promising things. You know, a number of our grantees in the United States have been part of hugely important progress that is that is happening now on criminal justice reform, on workers' rights and the future of workers in the future of work, voting rights, democracy, protecting the census. So it's a challenging space in which to work, but there is enormous and very, very 
exciting progress. Well, as you mentioned, you just launched the second phase of Build, which is another billion dollars, if I'm not mistaken, that will be going to grantees. And that, I'm sure, gives them a big sigh of relief that they can now go on and continue their work in those various spaces to, to drive our society forward. So congratulations to them and congratulations to the foundation for seeing fit to make that money available. Another area that I continue to marvel at is how as a society we tend to be so splintered. And, you know, we we can always expect that in a democracy, people are not going to always agree and we're going to have different opinions about how our society should move forward. But I would suspect that you're like me. Um, When you witness the events taking place at the Capitol earlier this year, um, that you were stunned and shocked by what you saw. And I commend you to a piece you wrote at the Center for Effective Philanthropy. And our good friend, Phil Buchanan, published it on their website. I think it was called Building the America That Never Was, Yet still must be. And, you know, in that piece, you sort of say to us that we have to be about two things at once. We have to be about bridging the divides in our country while we also work on social justice. We can't simply ignore the importance of one to solve the other problem. And It really struck me because those are two very difficult things to solve at the same time. It seems to me if you are working on racial equality, that you run across people who are very much opposed to that and who really don't want to hear anything you have to say. And if you happen to be in in the person who's trying to build bridges you might say to that person, I don't necessarily need to bridge that person. We just need to sound them out. They don't matter. What they have to say doesn't matter. But yet, as you mentioned, without a consistent sort of approach to bridging, I wonder if we can actually have sustainable progress on race. It seems that we can't avoid a backlash if we don't bring others along who presently may disagree, yet that's difficult work too. And I'm just wondering what your thoughts are about that and how we might find ways to do both. Well, I think that's that's such a hard question, Art. I mean, look at us after what happened in Minneapolis over the weekend, you know, and the the murder of Dante, you know, it just over and over and over again, you know, it would be one thing if in our recent past, there had been a pattern of violence like that and we were moving forward yep. to make things better, but over and over and over again, it keeps happening. There are many people in this country who feel left out, devalued, you know, afraid of what feels like a shrinking pie. I get that, but there is not an equivalency between, I don't think for people who, who have those kinds of fears who benefit by being white, and people who are, who have the same fears and are people of color, so we have to we have to face our history and we have to face ourselves in order to create you know that beautiful Langston Hughes poem. That's the where the title of that article came from. His poem, "The America That Never Was, Yet Still Must Be." You know, and Eric Liu talks about how we are one of the very few countries in the world that is built around an idea, you know, a creed. And we have not yet we have not yet achieved that idea. So to me, we can't bridge without also without without also reckoning with our history and also understanding the ways in which difference can be can be used to foster polarization and divides and to justify them. So there is really important and promising work about how to help people bridge across difference. The main point that I was trying to make in that article was that we can do both and we have to do both together. There, there has to be reckoning at the same time as there is, you know, movement, movement forward. 
So, Hillary, there were there were four things you mentioned in this article that you believe might help us move forward to both bridge and to also deal with the challenges associated with reckoning. Mm -hmm. One was to make room for anger in the work of love. Yes, that is a beautiful, beautiful piece from a feminist theologian, Beverly Harrison. And I think it's hugely important. And I think sometimes now in the U.S., you can you can feel people who are older struggling with what to do with it, with the expressed anger, especially of young people who are so angry at the ways in which this country is hypocritical about where it is. And the point I was trying to make there is that anger is part of what it means to be patriotic. It's part of what it means to solve a problem. And it is deeply threaded together with quote, the work of love, you know, the work of growth and healing and change. And so that's the larger point I'm trying to make in that article. We can't push down and push away the things that have made us angry. You know, there's really no way around them, but through them. And that's the point I was trying to make there. Yeah. You make it very well. Then you say, understand that there is no substitute for relationship. Yes. Yes. We need to change systems. We need to change laws, but, but we need to focus on our relationships. There's no substitute for that. And there are lots and lots of different ways and different kinds of organizations that are doing really, really important work in that regard. And I tried to lift up some of that, some of that work there. Yes. You call it, I think it's Civity, More mm -hmm. in Common, Citizen mm -hmm. University, People's Action and Open Mind. So we'll keep those organizations in people's uh, consciousness. Then you say face racism and patriarchy yeah. head on. Absolutely. They just are real. And they are used to keep power, keep, keep some people in, up and other people down and out. And I think you can't just paper over them into some kind of, you know, feel good bridging exercise. You really do have to look at them and how they function and how they are used, how they're constructed and how they are, are used. And that's the point I was trying to make there. Practice vigilance. Yes. Well, you know, there, I think I wrote about this, you know, the really important book on caste that Isabel Wilkerson wrote, but she starts that mm -hmm. book with the most powerful image of a, a lethal virus, I guess, really, that has been buried on, in the ice in a Nordic country. And as the glacier begins to thaw, it's released into the atmosphere and it begins to kill the reindeer, begins to kill the people that are there. And the point that she's making is that that virus of hatred and othering and polarization lives within us it, and lives within societies. And we can get better at containing it, but it never goes away. And so what we need are ways to, to be able to see when it is emerging in ways that are toxic and harmful, and then strategies as people and as a society, to be vigilant and to, to take action to contain it. Well, Hillary, you and I have seen a number of things in our lifetime that maybe we never thought we'd see. But we're not going to be here forever. So what do we hope our children will see in their lifetimes based on what we're trying to build today? Oh, Art, that's a really hard question. You want me to answer from the optimist in me or the pessimist in me? <laughs> you know, I've had guests on who say, depends on what day mm -hmm. you ask me. <laughs> so what day, what day is it for you? If it's an optimist day, give me the optimist answer or, or give me the hopeful answer. How about that? We're all here because we have hope. So give me the hopeful answer. Well, absolutely. You know, I actually have enormous hope in young people. I think that the the outpouring of organizing, the incredibly smart, actually, ways in which young people are organizing on, and, and the way in which they understand that all of these issues are, are intersectional, intersect with each other, that you can't have climate justice without gender justice, without racial justice. They're way more sophisticated than we were when we were coming up, doing the work that we were doing then. I think they are deeply skeptical of institutions and authority for good reason. And that's challenging because, you know, one of the ways in which you change things over the long term is through institutions and governments. 
But I feel very hopeful at the role of anger in their work of love and in the vision and energy that they're bringing to the to the change movements of this time, of our time. The most important change movements are being, being driven and, and led by young people and, and also very often by, by women and, and people of color, transgender people. And I think it is the very experience of having been on the margin of so much of the mental models and power structures that keep the world from thriving, that those kinds of leaders have a unique diagnosis, not only of what needs to change, but of the future that they want to build. They don't want to bring back a, a, a normal. The normal that the normal was never good. They want to really the normal was never good. that is fundamentally different and that is built on principles of sustainability and human thriving, you know, not growth at all cost. And I that makes me enormously, enormously hopeful. I feel like all of us in older generations need to feel an enormous sense of urgency, the same urgency that they feel, because you know, this next twenty or thirty years, without question, will be hugely determinative of the planet and human life on it. Yeah. I think you're right. If we're around 50 years from now, we will have solved a lot of big problems or maybe we, maybe there won't be a world. And one of which is climate for sure. Hillary, this is the heart of giving podcast. So I can't let you go without asking you a question about philanthropy and its future. And one of the big concerns I've had is that we seem to see a decline in the number of people donating to philanthropic organizations in the past decade or so. Yet, you know, the, the amount of money is, is still going up, mainly because wealthier people are giving more. But what does it mean for our society if we're not able to encourage this giving at the household level, so to speak? If we can't get families giving again, and if the trends continue, I don't know if people in 30 years will be giving to philanthropic organizations anymore. What do we need to do to inspire people? And maybe it's not giving to organizations. I don't know. Oh, Art, you know, I think that's such a, I'm not as pessimistic as you are. I, I do see the trends. I take them seriously. But look at something like Giving Tuesday. You know, which, mm-hmm. which yeah. raised in one day, uh, Giving Tuesday, over almost $2 billion. That's way more than the Ford Foundation gives out in the grants an entire year. So I think there's an, an enormous impetus towards generosity. And I don't think that that will go away. I think we, we need to use every form of social media and influence and communication we possibly can to communicate it is possible to make progress. It is possible to change things. There are hundreds of organizations and people working to do that every day, and they're making a difference. And supporting them is, you know, the most satisfying thing that, that anyone could do with their money or their time. And I think there are many, many people that believe that. I, I'm very hopeful that what we are seeing is a blip, not a forever change. Yeah, it could be a reflection of the lack of confidence that people are having in institutions and and institutions are doing better. I think we're seeing trust in institutions beginning to flatten out. And maybe that's the yeah. beginning of what will have to happen in order for people to to trust in the way that they used to. Mm-hmm. Well, Hillary, this has been a real pleasure for me. It's, it's almost like a full circle. You know, we started out, as I mentioned, many years ago on a small project connected by a friend. And here we are, both of our lives have expanded in ways that we didn't think about. And we're still here, you know, battling in our own ways to, to make the world a little bit better and to create opportunities for others to do so. So I am, I'm just, to say that I know you makes me proud and to, to look at what you've done and where you are makes me even prouder. And I'm just, just a real fan of Hillary Pennington and just thank you for what you're doing. Oh, Art, I, I would say the same right back to you. You know, ironically, I just walked, had a walk with our friend Jane literally last weekend. And, you know, I, I would just say that your leadership and the ways in which you keep holding a mirror up to these kinds of issues and have helped the sector to build a standard of 
what it means to be excellent and accountable are so impressive and so important. And you, you do it with this deep, deep humanity. So it's really a privilege to spend time with you again. Thank you. Well, guests, thank you. You've just heard Hillary Pennington, the vice president of programs at the Ford Foundation and about the great work going on there. If you want to hear other episodes of this podcast, you can find us on all major podcast platforms. Thank you for listening. You've just listened to the Heart of Giving podcast with Art Taylor. Be sure to tune in next time for a brand new episode. To listen to our other interviews, visit heartgiving.podbean.com. That's heartgiving.podbean.com. Subscribe to our show on major podcast platforms. Send your comments and ideas to Nona at thusmarket.com. That's Nona at thusmarket.com. The thoughts and opinions expressed on this podcast are the views and opinions of the guests, not those of the BBB Wise Giving Alliance or program affiliates. This podcast is for information and educational purposes only and is copyrighted with all rights reserved. This podcast is protected by Podbean's Terms of Service.